Hi, I'm Dr. James Thomas. In this series, I'm going over how to visualize nerve function in the larynx. In this video, we're going to take a look at one muscle, the lateral cricorytenoid muscle. And you can't see it, it's out far in the larynx, but what we are going to look at is the effect of this muscle. And to focus on the lateral cricorytenoid muscle, we want to focus on the vocal process. And if I use my arms here as the vocal cords, the V shape of the vocal cords, the vocal process is going to be my wrist. And we can watch two things. We can watch phonation on stroboscopy and we can watch breathing and breathing is often missed. So when you're recording with your endoscope and you want to see what the lateral cricorytenoid muscle is doing, train your eye on the vocal process and we'll look at a bunch of normals. So during breathing, the vocal process is going to move. In general, when you breathe in, they open up and when you breathe out, they close partway to resist airflow. But they do more than one thing. There's translation, that is the vocal process moves from lateral to medial with each breath. But there's also rotation of the joint and that is when the joint moves medially, it rotates inward, so that's expiration. And when you breathe with inspiration, the joint rotates laterally. So there's translation and there's rotation. And keeping our eye on the vocal process, we'll be able to watch a breath in and out, in and out. And with phonation, we expect them in general to come all the way together. So let's look at some normals, watch breathing, see what's going on there and see if we can keep our eye on one vocal process, uh, what it is doing. So we're watching here, respiration, breathing in and out, in and out. And we're watching the white spot, that is the vocal process. We're gonna ignore everything else in the picture here. Breathing out, in, breathing out, breathing in. And we're watching, comparing the two sides, we're watching the degree of motion. And quite often at the end of expiration, you'll see a little tremor. But in general, we're looking for symmetry and timing during respiration. In neurolaryngology, there's a couple of conditions that the nerve can be in. Paralysis where the nerve injury is complete. This is actually rather uncommon. Uh, but if the nerve had been cut, there would be no rotation of the vocal process and quite often other branches would be affected. Much more common is paresis when there's been a partial injury and there's limited rotation of the vocal process. And then there's the condition of mixed re -innervation. That is after an injury, the nerve tends to grow from the brain back down into the muscle. And if more than one branch has been injured, the nerve fibers may cross over and go to an inappropriate muscle. And this happens when the posterior cricorytenoid fibers, the ones that open the vocal cord, some of them go into the lateral cricorytenoid muscle. And this alters when the vocal process moves. If we imagine that the crossover is exactly 50%, then we get a stable vocal process that neither abducts nor adducts, it's constantly held in a given position. But a little more common is dyskinesis. That is that we expect during inspiration opening and expiration closing, but if the crossover is inappropriate, we may get some sort of change in the timing of closure, change in the degree, or even the wrong direction when one side is opening and the other side may be closing because of this crossover. So we can imagine there's an area in the brain that activates the lateral cricorytenoid muscle. So these LCA brain fibers innervate the actual LCA muscle and we would call this normal functioning if firing in the LCA center in the brain makes the LCA muscle move. And that typically occurs during expiration, which we've just watched, and it occurs during phonation, so that anytime you want to narrow or close the glottis, the LCA part of the brain will fire. So what you're trying to observe is timing during an event. Does the vocal process rotate 
and move medially during expiration and during phonation. And you can evaluate that timing relative to the other side. So you can look at left and then right and see if there's a delay between one side and the other. You can also look at the arc of rotation toward the midline, and that should, in general, be symmetric. Both during phonation, it should be symmetric and complete, and during expiration, it should be symmetric and partial closure, kind of depending on the degree of positive end expiratory pressure that you need. So someone with COPD will tend to close nearly completely the vocal cords during expiration. And you can watch to see if the vocal process is translocating, but not rotating. And this can occur if there's competitive tension with the posterior cricorytenoid muscle tending to hold it open and limit the amount of closure. And it can also be if the LCA muscle is weak and the interretinoid is compensating and pulling medially without rotating the vocal process. And finally, there's translocation with opposite overcompensation. So the vocal cords look like they've completely closed and lined up, but one side is paretic, has a reduced arc, but it appears complete because the opposite side goes past the midline. So these are some of the observations we can look for. So we're training ourselves to look at each vocal process and it can be hard to look at them both at the same time. So sometimes you wanna slow it down, look at the left, look at the right, and repeat. And let's move on to a case where they aren't symmetric. And here we're watching the right side is acting normally. The right vocal process during respiration is completely opening during inspiration and closing during expiration. And the left vocal process is perhaps moving and it is moving at the correct time. It is moving medially during expiration and laterally during inspiration, but the degree of rotation is minimal when compared to the right side. We've been watching the vocal processes during respiration. One of their main uses is during phonation, bringing the vocal cords together so you can blow air through and make them vibrate during phonation. And this is when we most want to see them for causes of hoarseness. However, many times the view is obstructed by the arytenoids. The arytenoids sometimes are tipped forward and cover up this vocal process that we've been wanting to look at. The key to this then is to use topical anesthesia on the vocal cords, anesthetize them with lidocaine and put our camera in. And when we get the endoscope in, we want to go in under the arytenoids, lift them up, and then we can see the vocal processes. Let's take a look at some examples. So here we have a weak breathy voice, but the glottis closes very quickly. The false vocal cords cover the true vocal cords and the arytenoids cover the vocal processes. So we hear a problem leaking air, but we can't see what's going on with the posterior commissure. So we'll apply topical lidocaine and have another look. We have our endoscope in the posterior commissure and made a recording. I've stopped the frame here where the right vocal process is essentially in the midline, leaving it parallel to the membranous cord while the left side is canted laterally, and this leaves a gap on the left side to leak air. The second aspect of this is that any changes in this configuration will be most visualized at low pitch because at high pitch, you activate the superior laryngeal nerve, cricothyroid muscle, and pull the vocal cords longer, and any abnormal opening of the lateral cricorytenoid will be pulled together. So the superior laryngeal nerve can be used to compensate. And we want to remove compensation. Look at the lateral cricorytenoid muscle, the LCA muscle, when it's acting alone. So that will be during phonation and low pitch. And when we slow our video recording down, we gain a perspective on 
how much compensation is actually coming from the right side. The right vocal process is actually pushing past the midline. Here we have three images at high, medium, and low pitch. In the leftmost image, the right vocal process is near the midline, and the left vocal process is canted laterally. As she drops down in pitch, moving across the screen, the left vocal process gets canted further and further laterally, giving her a larger and larger gap, although the right vocal process actually pushes harder and harder at lower pitch, trying to adjust the compensation. Let's review a case where the left lateral coccorytenoid muscle weakness is subtle. The true vocal cords come all the way together and if you focus on them, it will seem like everything's normal. And to a degree it is, the thyroid muscles are in fact fairly equivalent. So if you can get the vocal processes to come together, whether they rotate together or whether they slide together, you'll have a relatively normal uh, voice, except it's weaker than normal because you can't tightly close it. And in this case, to see the subtle weakness, we're gonna slow the video down. We're gonna watch the onset of phonation and we're gonna watch the right side move medially and rotate the vocal process inward while the left side tends to translate but does not rotate inward. E this is most apparent when we slow the video down. Notice how the vocal process on the right is leading while the vocal process on the left is lagging, both in speed and in angulation. It's even more apparent her dysfunction during respiration and that is that when she breathes out expiration, the vocal processes should rotate. And we see the right side rotating and the left fails to rotate very much at all. And this is another great view of how on the right side, the vocal process is rotating and leading the closure, while on the left side, it is not rotating and it's being dragged towards the middle. In this case, we can watch the strength of the left side as they close to make sound, the left side pushes the right laterally. And then as the individual goes up in pitch, the cricothyroid muscle gradually straightens them out and compensates for the right-sided lateral cricorytenoid muscle weakness. <laughs> Although both vocal processes were able to rotate the vocal cords to the midline for phonation, at this pitch, the left side has pushed the right vocal process laterally. As he goes up in pitch, the cricothyroid muscles pull tight and bring the right vocal process back into the midline. This case is an example of why it's so important to see the posterior commissure. When you first look, the vocal cords don't come all the way together, but they appear to align and they vibrate fairly symmetrically. Her entire anterior branch of the recurrent nerve is affected, so both the thyroid muscle and the lateral cricorytenoid are affected. 
When she breathes in, we can see how the right vocal cord is very atrophic. That's the weakness in the thyroid muscle. And then we watch on expiration to evaluate the lateral cricorytenoid muscle. But when you both watch it in slow motion, you can see that there is almost no rotation of the right vocal process. It slides inward. The left one rotates in and the right one doesn't. And it's super obvious when you put your camera in, the flexible endoscope in, underneath the arytenoids, then you can see the configuration of the posterior commissure and how the lateral cricorytenoid paresis is the primary cause of the vocal weakness and hoarseness. In this case, there's fairly obviously some injury on the right, and we have the left side to compare function. So we'll watch her breathing. And when we see this, we're asking ourselves, is this a paralysis? That is there, is there no function on the right? We could answer negative, it's clearly moving. Is it a paresis? Is it weakness? Well, it could be, except that when we compare side to side, we're not really seeing a lack of motion on the right side. We're seeing active motion that is abnormal in degree and timing. So it's some sort of mixed re -innervation. and we want to sort out is this balanced or synkinetic, or is it unbalanced? And we'll call it dyskinetic re -innervation. When we watch for a while, we see that the right side has fasciculations or unsteadiness. So there's clearly neural input and it's quite irregular. And at first, it seems like the right side is mostly stable during respiration. So we might initially lean towards calling this synkinesis with some sort of re -innervation that balances opening and closing during respiration. But then, with a deep breath in, we see a twitch on the right side. And I think it's very helpful to slow this down to see the timing of the twitch and what direction does the vocal process move on the right side Sniff. as the left side is opening. And a sniff provides maximal stimulus. So when you elicit a sniff in a patient, we should see the vocal process move to its most abducted position. This rotational movement that we're seeing on the right arytenoid is not from Bernoulli effect. This rotation during sniffing is PCA brain fibers activating the okay. lateral cricorytenoid muscle. Bernoulli effect is typically a membranous vocal cord finding. The next case is about a woman who 25 years ago had a thyroidectomy and woke up without a voice. She was told the nerve had been injured. In fact, they had tried to stitch it back together. And for about six months, she had almost no voice at all. Her voice recovered and she'd been living well for about 20 years. When five years ago, she began to experience uh, spasms or episodes where she would find it difficult to breathe for periods of time, 15 to 45 minutes, she says. In fact, she's been to the emergency room, she's been to her family doctor, a number of specialists, she's been treated for asthma. And her main complaint are that these episodes have been increasing over the past five years. So we're going to take a look and see if we can focus on what's going on in this case, particularly with her lateral cricorytenoid muscle after this presumed injury 25 years ago. Say he, he, he. He, he, he. I think a reasonable initial first take on this is that there's dyskinesis. The left side's not moving normally. In fact, probably it looks like synkinesis here in that it's not moving much at all, but it holds its own when she goes to make sound so it certainly has tension in it. I'm able to hear some white noise each time she breathes inward. And here when I ask her to take a deep breath, we see Bernoulli effect creating that white noise. 
that is the left membranous vocal cord draws inward on a deep breath. And it does that because it's so close to the other vocal cord. I spoke with her, getting her to use her voice, then had her exercise, and then topically anesthetized her vocal cords. So she had been quite stimulated. And when I looked again, the findings suggested hyperadduction of her left vocal process. And when I'm able to put the endoscope underneath her arytenoids, we can see that the left vocal process is angled quite acutely across the midline. I think of this as PCA fibers from the brain have plugged into the lateral cricorytenoid muscle so that the deeper she takes a breath, the brain thinks it's opening the vocal cords, but the neural input is going to adduction and narrows her airway. As a way of proving my conjecture that not only was the left side not paralyzed, it was not synkinetic, it was dyskinetic. That was, the vocal process was pushed way past and hyperadducted during her breathing. I offered to inject the left lateral cricorytenoid muscle with botulinum toxin. And when I did, here's what her vocal cords looked like two weeks later. She could breathe again normally. <laughs> 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 Her left lateral cricorytenoid muscle now positions the left vocal process somewhere near the midline. It's enough tension to give her a voice, and yet she has a much larger airway to breathe through. After repeating the botulinum toxin injection into the left lateral cricorytenoid muscle several times, we decided to pursue something more permanent. I performed a surgery on her neck where I went into her larynx and divided the nerve that goes to her lateral cricorytenoid muscle. And I borrowed a nerve which supplied one of the muscles in the neck, specifically the omohyoid muscle. And that nerve called the ansa cervicalis, I routed into her larynx, hooked it up to the lateral cricorytenoid branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve and allowed it to grow in and replace the original nerve. Here she is two weeks after the surgery when the innervation has been cut to the anterior branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So now there's essentially no input to the TA and LCA muscles. E <gasps> By two months post denervation, some of the ansa cervicalis has grown in and effectively given adductor activity to the anterior branch of the recurrent laryngeal e nerve. By nine months after the surgery, the ansa cervicalis should have nearly completely grown into the anterior branch, and she effectively has tonic adduction holding these muscles into position during phonation. I'd like to talk about this case study of a woman with one year of hoarseness. I don't know all the details, she does say that about two years ago, she was in the hospital for a heart problem, but did not have a tube in her throat. This is an instructive case because when we focus on the vocal processes, we're going to be looking for the difference between translation and rotation. And it's that difference that's going to help us avoid confusion about what to do with this patient. But I think the injury is different, and I think there's an injury on both sides. So let's take a look at this closely, uh, slow some of the events down, and see if we can figure out what has gone on with her nerves. Stopping on this frame of the video, I think a gut reaction here is to say, well, the left side's paralyzed. That is, you look at it and it looks like the left side's not opening. And she told you she got hoarse and the left side doesn't open and you might jump to the conclusion that we need to do something about the left side. But let's slow things down and look at the left side. First of all, it's not paralyzed, it is moving. It just does not move through a very large range. The left vocal process clearly opens during inspiration. 
and during a sniff, it opens even further. But during the sniff, the left vocal process never rotates laterally. It's as if it has tonic input keeping it from rotating out fully. This suggests to me that she had an injury in the past on the left side and it recovered, and this is dyskinesis on the left side. She's still somewhat functional with it because it's incomplete, but it is inappropriate abduction. When she goes to phonate, the left vocal process moves through a small range, but in an appropriate direction at an appropriate time. It seems to even reach the midline. There are still LCA fibers that go to the LCA muscle, but it seems like there's been crossover between PCA and LCA fibers that prevent it from opening very far. They fight against each other when she takes a breath inward. If her current complaint was difficulty breathing, then we would want to be looking for an impairment in abduction, but it isn't. Her complaint's about voice, so let's take a look at the right vocal process and see what it is doing. When we focus on the right vocal process during inspiration, it appears to abduct fully, so the PCA muscle seems to be working well on the right. During expiration, we expect the LCA muscle to fire, and we don't see any rotation of the right vocal process, suggesting that it's not firing at all or minimally, and maybe the pull is just from the interarytenoid muscle. When we focus our eyes on the right vocal process at the onset of phonation, we see very little movement on the right, and there's no rotation, only translation of the right joint. That suggests or confirms that there's very little LCA input going to the LCA muscle. I'll briefly touch on one thyroarytenoid muscle finding here on the right. That is the right vocal cord during stroboscopy tends to oscillate more lateral than the left, so it has less tension, and it spends longer period of time in that lateral phase, again, suggesting lack of tension within the right thyroarytenoid muscle. <laughs> Combining the findings on the right of a weak thyroarytenoid muscle and a weak lateral cricorytenoid muscle, I would say that this recent onset loss of voice is from an anterior branch injury on the right, probably a viral injury, and she can't close the right side, so she's leaking air, and that makes her voice soft. The left-sided neurologic injury probably represents an old injury that has recovered with some re that's been misdirected. That side can probably be left alone at this point. I would consider doing something to close the gap on the right side as an initial approach based on this kind of reasoning. All right then, I hope these example cases have been instructive and that you're able to focus your eyes on the vocal process and identify when the lateral cricorytenoid muscle has been injured. I think it's the most missed injury in neurolaryngology. I'm Dr. James Thomas, the voice doctor. Feel free to comment on the video in the comments below. I'll try to address as many questions as I can.